liked it. You Good. decided how to say, I, uh, you know, you can do either our vision or our future. Right? Yeah. Got yeah. you. I just got both of them since right. it was right. two words. So, so good to meet you. I yeah. really am pleased. They're going to enjoy this. It was a good talk, too. Yeah. So, so the Michiganders have to stick together, huh? Indeed. Yeah. yeah. And isn't it an interesting time? And welcome. Welcome very much to our conversation. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Mark Volpel. And he's a uh, filmmaker, and he's also got a very illustrious and interesting career. And he's got a project just recently completed called Our Future, Our Vision. Uh, which we're going to show clips of, and Mark, welcome really very much to conversation. Thank you. It's great to be here. It is good. We had a good, lively discussion on the telephone the other day, and we do have an hour, and we're going to want to show a good, uh, uh, goodly amount of the clips from your Our Vision, Our Future uh, dot US, uh, your tape. But I wonder maybe you could share with us, if you could, your background, where you were born and drug up and uh, that sort of thing, and some of your uh, background, and then it'll lead into this uh, project that's out on the uh, hustings now. But could you share some of your own background, please? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, you know, I'm a filmmaker. Yes. And I've basically been involved in various aspects of filmmaking since I was about 20, um, mm -hmm. since I was an undergraduate in college. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been involved, early on I was involved in some film study, uh, research, you know, the history of film, but I very rapidly was a filmmaker. And then I, I sort of got involved in, um, when I came to New York, I got involved with making kind of like, you know, low-level, low-budget kind of East Village art projects and um, things like that. Um, things, things can be <laughs> pretty good that in that context. I oh, mean, absolutely. In some case, you can learn a lot, you know, and... A lot of creativity can be found there, often, times, not always, but sometimes, okay? <laughs> no, without yeah. question. You know, yeah. I once, uh, just a f uh, all these footnotes of certain people, like I once actually uh, uh, was a cameraman on a small, low-budget film, Nobody's Getting Paid, starring Vincent Gallo as a vampire. So I see, uh-huh. Sure. Um, and the t d No One's Gonna Get Paid was the name of the film? <laughs> no, it was, oh. Uh, oh. I can't remember the name of the film. That would be a good title, man, <laughs> really, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> zero <laughs> budget productions <laughs> incorporated. Yeah, or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. there is an old saying in the business, yeah. which is deferred pay means no pay. I see. That All would right. be another yeah fun title. But uh, it's you know, a labor of love for a lot of people. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah. Um, I uh, I sort of got involved just um, as a strategy, uh, as a way to make a living, mm -hmm. while I was kind of making creative projects into digital visual effects mm -hmm. um, and digital filmmaking. Mm -hmm. um, when I first was doing computer graphics, people used to ask me, what do you do? And I would say, computer graphics. And they would say, what's that? Yes, right. And I would then explain, um, well, it's where you make pictures with a computer. Yes. And people would say, why would you want to do that? Yeah, when you, you know. You know, they'd say, why? Why bother yeah. making pictures with a computer? And I would try to explain it, you yeah. know, that, well, it's a way of controlling images. It's a way of creating images. It's unique. It's incredibly creative. And C-Graph, they used to have, I think, C-Graph, where people would get together or and so you were involved in those, that crowd, yeah, as it were, absolutely. out in California a lot? Or? From 1983 up until about three years ago, I went to every single SIGGRAPH except one. So that would be about, I don't know, 16 or 17. Right. Um, and then eventually people would say, what do you do? And I'd say computer graphics. And they would say, oh, is that where you make the letters spin around? Yes, right. And I'd say, well, yeah, I guess. And uh -huh. now, as you know, you know, the yeah. industry, uh, high-end imagery is really dominated by digital techniques. Okay, okay. So well, I, I, I would probably want to learn some of that because I do mostly just talking here. But I know it's a great uh, burgeoning art form of the highest order, yeah. Well, it's just like how we now do our writing and we do our organizational stuff on a computer. Also, we do the, you know, we do a lot of the filmmaking work now is done on a computer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I eventually went back to, I, I got a graduate degree at, in filmmaking and film production at NYU. NYU, here in New York. Yeah, yeah right. here in New York. You're um, originally out of the Midwest, though, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I grew up in the suburbs of Detroit. I grew Michigan. up in Detroit. So, you see, we have that common background, yeah? Indeed. Yeah. Um, um, once we got our driver's license, yes. we spent a lot of time downtown Detroit, you <laughs> yeah. know, doing, having fun, enjoying ourselves. Right. Um, and, you know, I eventually got involved in a lot of high-end visual effects. I mm -hmm. started doing a lot of uh, s visual effects for feature films, big Hollywood visual effects extravaganzas. And, you know, I only the most shots I ever worked on in a film was maybe only 15. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started uh, also doing a lot of high-end visual effects work for TV commercials, mm -hmm. you know, for really, you know, top, top you know, high-end, high the you know, Chrysler, GM, 
you know, big corporate campaigns. A advertising? Yeah. Yeah, advertising, because that's where uh, Master McLuhan used to say the program was just there to be between the advertising and the creative yeah. talent. Yeah. And it is creative talent. goes yeah. into the making of ads. High end. What is high end when we say that? What are we talking about when you say high end? We, we could go all the way up to something like DreamWorks or Lucas or something now. But when you say high end, could you differentiate that from, let's say, middle end <laughs> or low end or, you know? It just means that people who have the most money to spend and say, we want something that people have never seen before, mm -hmm. we're going to go. I mean, I would, if yeah. I was to just try to define it, I would say that. that people yeah. say, well, we, we have as close to an unlimited amount of money as anybody does and we want to show people something whether it's in a movie or in a TV commercial that they've never seen. And so the money gives you access to the latest technological gadgets that yeah. can help do that. Is that more or less what it is? Uh, yeah. And also high art. We talk about high art. Is there a comparison between high-end digital uh, developments and high art? We talked to Michelangelo was pretty good with a hammer and chisel and a brush and that sort of thing. And there's high art and then there's a lot of, do you understand? I'm just trying yeah. to get it fixed. In no, terms I of think it's true. I think the, it's the I community of which you're a part. I think it's a fair correlation because, you know, there are a lot of, you know, money attracts a lot of gifted artists or craftspeople. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah. I, and then, you know, ultimately I got kind of tired of working for the highest bidder myself. Uh -huh. um, I did enjoy sort of, I don't know, I might call it the fetishization of the image that people have in advertising. Yeah. You know, you have 30 seconds. Yeah. People are spending, you know, I, I started directing Millions. TV commercials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was directing TV commercials, and I um, directed a 60-second commercial with a half-million-dollar budget, mm -hmm. and there's like 25 people mm -hmm. who have to be happy with the product. Uh -huh. um, you know, on the corporate side, on the agency side, even internal to my company, the production company. Um, so you people mean people in marketing and people who have the corporate image and the people, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'm just talking about kind of how the political and social process of making a commercial, that there's so many people. Extremely important to yeah. understand in this age of images and so forth. Yeah, that's a very important thing. In the film world, you have a writer very often, and the writer will have a property. We'll begin with the property, and then it'll get chopped all out of proportion to what the writer thinks it should be. Do you have the same sort of thing? And when you're producing a high-end television advertisement, it begins with a concept, it begins with an idea, that sort of thing, and then you're, you were the director of that, and does the director have the same kind of control, final cut, say, or whatever it is, in terms of that we can see analogies between that and the feature film industry and so forth, as far as advertising, or you say 25 people have to sign off on it? Uh, there is a saying, too many cooks spoil the broth, or a <laughs> committee never does anything very creative. Those kind of things are swimming around in my mind and could you address it? Yeah, well, it's interesting because when that many people are involved, it's the one good thing about a committee approach, to, I don't like the committee approach to filmmaking you do not. personally. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's not that pleasurable. Uh -huh. um, but there is one good attribute to it, which mm -hmm. is it's, it's very hard for them to change their minds. Once they set down a course mm -hmm. and, you know, they've got the 25 people that are supposed to like it or say, signing off on the idea, the concept, the mm -hmm. strategy, the the filmmaking, um, the, from a conceptual pre-production standpoint, yes. it's very hard for them to just on a whim change their mind. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Hollywood, you know, yeah. when you have a producer mm -hmm. and a director, mm -hmm. and it's sort of their product and they're the auteurs, mm -hmm. they can and they often do change mm -hmm. their mind on a dime. Mm -hmm. So it's a very different construct, but um, it, it's interesting because, no, the director often doesn't have that much control in advertising. Mm -hmm. um, they have control over the visuals. Mm -hmm. um, but they, the concept and everything else is really defined and controlled by the agency. By the agency yeah. and the auteur. You say the auteur tradition. You like the auteur tradition where somebody's got control over everything? If that's what I understand auteur to mean, that yeah. you've got somebody who's got the vision, the thing, and control over the whole thing more than a collaborative effort. Right. I don't mean to get into deep, but it's really an important dynamic as far as uh, communication is concerned. I couldn't agree more. You know, mm. the auteur approach yeah, to right. creation works great when the auteur is Michelangelo. 
is great. <laughs> yes. When right. the auteur is not great, then, um, then, problems, then yeah. the auteur approach, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is problematic. And I, you know, Paul Morrissey, who directed the the, the Andy Warhol movies, yeah. mm -hmm. you know, the the budget of the Andy Warhol movies after not the art films, not sleep, but the feature films, you know, like uh, you know Andy Warhol's Frankenstein. Yeah. Um, Paul Morrissey had a quote, and it's possible I'm changing this quote a little bit, but I. He said the auteur, um, yeah. the auteur theory was the death of cinema. Uh -huh. And uh, the, the idea yeah. behind that is that potentially if you have, you know, a mediocre filmmaker yeah. and you treat him or her like the auteur, but yeah. they're not, the auteur. They, don't ha they're not, they don't have the experience or the talents to, um, you know, to merit it, then mm -hmm. you can get some very mediocre films yeah. being made. Um, whereas if you mm -hmm. go back to the studio system mm -hmm. in the 40s, yeah. Um, there was a much higher level of consistency of the quality of the films because it was so collaborative. Uh -huh. You know, the the storyboards, were, and, and actually if you look at directors yeah. during mm -hmm. those times, um, uh, th uh, a director might direct four or five pictures in a year mm -hmm. because all the, all the director was doing was directing the film. Mm -hmm. They weren't pre-producing it, raising the money, doing the storyboards. They weren't editing it. The studio did all that. Ooh, they brought the in the producer would do, or the executive producer or something. Um, yeah. Or the studio. Okay, yeah. The uh, studio. Yeah, the, studio. the business end, as it were. Well, then, you know. In advertising agencies, if I'm not mistaken, yeah. and forgive my naivete or not lack of knowledge, you have the business guys, then you have the creative side in advertising. Yeah, but they sort yeah. of mix it up and yeah. work together and right. collaborate. But, okay. you know, I, I, I was, uh, I, I think, I was, attracted to film personally because I, I liked its subversive nature. You okay, know? good. I like that. I like yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. I don't think there's a e better way mm -hmm. um, to change somebody's mind mm -hmm. about something than yeah. with a film. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, I and don't you think lump you film and video in together and now they're sure. sort of, they're, 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 with the digital thing, they're really morphing, aren't they? Or yeah. Are they? yeah. Th you know, they're yeah. different, but mm -hmm. they're related and uh, you know, people uh, used to ask me. I don't. I haven't gotten asked this question for a while because people have figured it out. But people used to ask me, "What do you prefer, film or video?" Yeah. And I would say that's like asking me, um, "What do you prefer, uh, a compact Toyota car or a stretch limo?" And let me just illustrate. Because okay, uh, if Spell I'm driving, yeah. if I'm driving from yeah. New York to San Francisco, yeah. And I'm paying for the gas myself. I'm yeah. probably going to choose the Toyota compact mm -hmm. um, car. Yeah. Um, if I'm at a party and I'm uptown and I'm Park Avenue and I want to go downtown, or you know, I don't know. Not, mm. not that I'm in that situation of using a limo hardly ever no? myself. No. Um, oh. I know. Got it's tuxedo? <laughs> I do. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. Right. All right. Um, but the thing uh, is, there's situations where yeah. you say, "Hey, I, I'm with some friends. We're having a good time. We just mm. want to go downtown. We're in Manhattan." A stretch limo would be great, right? Maybe you your know? analogy should more be the Toyota or whatever car and a yeah. Winnebago. And if you're coming across the country, you got a Winnebago with air conditioning and all that. That would be what you would. I don't know. Maybe I'm just stretching that sort of thing. That's another. I it I has to do with budget and so forth. Well, it has no. to do with that one, each one has their uses. Yeah. Okay. Right. You use film when film's the right choice. Yeah. Use video when video's the right choice. I know some choice. guys. I've seen some high definition. Excuse again my ignorance, right? Yeah. And I really appreciate learning from you here. But I've seen some this high definition television now. Yeah. Knocks my socks off. It looks yeah. like 35 millimeter. Yeah. I swear. But I've uh, some guys who were in film. And they will swear to God, it'll never be, it doesn't have the color or the richness or something of 35 or even 70 millimeters. I mean, they're really dedicated to film. But they are morphing, and more and more of the, te of the film industry is being run through the digital process. Yeah. Now, is it not? And is that not the future of uh, communication? Digital imaging is the future. Yeah, in okay, fact, right. um, you know, and I you've been And you've been involved in that in the trenches at, at, from its birth. Uh, yeah. It seems to me with your career path. Yeah, since this comes yeah. up, I actually, I, I worked at um, what was in the 90s, mm -hmm. and many people would say was the largest and most successful and did the best work uh, visual effects house in New York City Which called was that? R. Greenberg Associates, Okay, uh -huh. RGA. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and when I joined them in 1991, right. uh, the computer animation department there was six people. Yeah. And uh, a year later, I was, the, I was the director of that department. I was running the department. And within six years, we had 26 people. Right. Okay. Big and growth. I watched that company, um, which on the East Coast, uh, you, like I said, many people would consider it to have been the premier um, 
visual effects and post-production company on the East Coast. All right. I, in the five or six years I was running the computer graphics department there, I saw the company go from being a film company to being a digital media company. All right. Uh huh. Yeah. Um, and you it lived through the transformation. It's like yeah. a birth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, there's good things about it. There's bad things about it. The things that people forget is film has flaws. Mm -hmm. Every time we run a film through a projector, it gets scratched. Yeah. Yeah. When you go to see a Hollywood print and uh, you know pay ten dollars and you mm -hmm. go see something, it's at the end of the run. Often there will be all these vertical scratches on well, the film because yeah, of the mechanical flaws. Now. Yeah. The perfect projector mm -hmm. is not going to scratch the film, but mm -hmm. we don't live in a perfect world. So no. the only reason I bring that up is because um, nobody is saying scratch film is great, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We, in digital media, we don't have a problem with scratches. So yeah. it's just one example of something that we eliminate yeah. one problem. Right. Um, there are essential differences in um, in the two media, but but what's happening is, uh, you know, the digital. High, you know, as you point out, the mm -hmm. high def image is really mm -hmm. getting closer to film, and you know, sure, you can say it will never get there, mm -hmm. but you know, it has certain advantages at certain times. Yeah, the digital thing is really. It seems to me, from our perspective here in public access, where yeah. this is digital now, and it's really democratizing things too, because the cameras are getting better, and the technology is getting better. It's getting less expensive. It's yeah. getting better all the time, and even the editing and so forth. They got Final Cut Pro. You don't even have to have Avid if you don't want, but you know that kind of thing. So it's a good thing yeah. by and large, and it's part of the leading edge of communication as we look ahead. And you've been involved in all that, and I congratulate you on that career path. Now, I wonder if we could. You were looking at uh, maybe some of the pro you were involved in a couple of films. Maybe we could tick those off, and then we want to get to the one project, the project that you have yes. in the works and out in the world, and yeah. uh, we're going to show a demonstration of and that sort of thing. Yeah. And, but when you said tick off films, it's hadn't you been involved in a couple of films, feature uh, films? Yeah, feature film that I worked on the visual effects for. Yes. Uh -huh. Oh yeah, um, I worked on the visual effects for the last action hero, Demolition Man, The Shadows, starring mm -hmm. Alec Baldwin. Mm -hmm. um, I worked on some of the technical aspects of some shots for Braveheart. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Um, Boy, that guy yeah. was really tough. I mean, you get on that horse in the middle of a <laughs> blizzard. I don't know how he did it. He didn't even have a shirt on. Yeah. The guy Braveheart, the character. Yeah. But there's a lot of special, you know, I, I I got cold looking at him. And he would ride that horse. He was really tough. Yeah. And he put that paint on his face. But you yeah. had to put these, you did these special effects well, things. Well, these were shots of the horses. Uh, you know, sometimes the horses got injured. and yeah. things Because they didn't right. really want to injure horses. Right, would be a right. Good. A generated yeah. weapon would go into the chest of a horse. Yeah. You know, something like that. Uh-huh. Yeah. And you would work that out. And they can do wonders with the digital processing now. And yeah. they can do wonders with animation. It's it's a great uh, form. Now, why don't we try to move along, if yeah. we can, to the projects you've been involved with. Okay. Uh, and I guess that's your baby, as they say. Maybe you yeah. could talk about it, our vision, our future, yeah. and then uh, how it came about and where it stands. And then we'll maybe show the folks some examples of this uh, if I'm fair to say, it's sort of like a satirical thing that you've gotten involved in. Right? Absolutely. Did you write it? Did you do it? I I wrote. I co-wrote it. I had two main writing partners, mm -hmm. um, David Worth and Matt Johnson, and uh, uh, there were some other people that were involved in some early brainstorming sessions. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it basically, it's called Our Vision, Our Future. That's a term that corporations use a lot for their mission statement, isn't it? Which our vision, our future. It's a it's a corporate thing. Uh, 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 I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I did, I, go ahead. No, have you heard that phrase before? No. Our yeah. Vision, our future? Yeah. It's those thing. two things together. Yeah. 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 Our vision. Yeah. Our future? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the the League of uh, the Grapefruit Growers or something, and they will have a vision, our future. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You could do a search on it. You get a whole bunch of uh, corporate uh, things that are presenting our vision, our future. It's a mission statement kind okay. of thing, but it's perfect for what you're <laughs> doing. If it seems to yeah. me, but I'm sorry, I didn't want to get way late. Yeah, not at all. That's um, the title of the entity. Yeah, it's called Our Vision, Our Future, uh -huh. and. Um, you know, I uh, I've been very frustrated with the political situation in this country. You too? Um, yeah, me too. Uh -huh. I have been, and uh, uh -huh. you know, I do think there are multiple. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Yes. All right. Right. I actually yeah. do think there yeah. are multiple ways uh -huh. to look at things. To look many at the ways world. to skin a cat, right? Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. there's multiple political views, mm -hmm. and uh, 
Right. You know, I, I think I, I don't. I think there are Republicans, and yeah. there, there are certain beliefs that used to be central to the Republican Party. That yeah. I could understand people arguing for them. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. know, fiscal responsibility well, being one, or what happened um, to that? Uh, right. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> yeah. But you know, but the present political situation has gotten a little out of it's control. It's tour. I mean, it's the theater of the absurd, to my yeah. way of thinking. It's Beckett, you know. I mean, yeah. to my, but anyway, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, you know, I used to, I said this about the first uh, George Bush president, is I thought basically everything he said was a lie. He'd mm. walk up to a microphone <laughs> and he'd just start lying. Yeah. And it was like if you wanted to know the truth, mm. all you'd have to do is take what they said and turn and it around turn. 180 degrees and, and you'd you have are. the truth. You're in truthland, yeah. So, w you know, and then, you know, we were, mercifully, we only had one term of the first George Bush, and mm. then we had the latest term. Mm -hmm. And again, it's just lies. It's mm. like um, they simply, all they know how to do is lie. You're talking about political, uh, uh, all aspects of the political spectrum? You're talking about this administration. Oh, the current one. Yes. Okay, okay. Uh -huh. I'm saying they don't know how to do anything but lie. You sort of jumped over Clinton then. You said Clinton came in after one term yeah. of Mr. George no, Herbert yeah, Walker well we had Bush. Clinton. And then we had Clinton. Yeah. And uh, had a growth of the, a, a whole bunch of growth in the digital technology and the dot com and all that kind of stuff. They're, they had a heck of a record in some ways. Robert Rubin sort of reigned in the deficit and yeah. that kind of stuff. But I don't want to get off on tech. Uh, well, the thing, Clinton did lie about his personal life. Um, yeah, which, he had that. You know, I don't know. I think people do that. And mm. if, people, if, if a public figure is going to lie, I would prefer them to lie about their personal <laughs> life. <laughs> yes, which that's right. It's not what yeah. I'm concerned about. Yeah, I'm right. concerned Me about too. what they're doing with the taxpayers' money yeah. and, you know, how they're using the United States' position. Um, of power and military authority in the world, and things like that. And know? the stewardship of the planet, yeah. spaceship Earth. Yeah, yeah uh -huh. th those things, that's kind of what I care yeah, about. Yeah, me too, so me too. Oh. When people actually are acting completely on the basis of um, benefiting corporations and having the environment suffer, but they paint it in a way where they're claiming mm -hmm. that they're actually benefiting the environment, this mm -hmm. gets very disturbing. Yeah, it gets um, uh, Goebbels. Yeah, maybe. well, I you know. don't know. That's sort of maybe <laughs> overdrawn, but yeah, it's propaganda, right. and it is a big ad campaign. You had a good, you had. I mean, th that's what the election is. It's a big. Yeah. Vance Packard would love it. The Hidden Persuaders writer. I mean, it's a it's an ad campaign. Yes, yeah. and um, so you know, uh, when I I did get out of the ad business about five years ago. Okay. I'm now a professor. I teach filmmaking. Yeah. I have all my own DV equipment at home, and I make my own DV projects. You can do it all on your desktop? Yeah, you know. Isn't that great? Yeah. You like that? I love it. Yeah, okay, good. I right. love it. Right, right. And I've focused my own personal work on focusing on understanding storytelling and story structure and writing and also working with acting. You do writing? Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, all and right. I wrote, uh, I co-wrote Our Vision, Our Future, mm -hmm. which we're going to be looking at shortly. Uh -huh. um, but uh, I was always, you know, I, I said earlier, I was always a attracted to film because I thought it was the most subversive mm -hmm. art form. Right. You could actually change somebody's mind yeah. with film. Yeah. Uh, film combines emotion mm -hmm. and intellect. Right. You know, intellectual ideas and emotional feelings yeah. in a way that's more powerful and I think more subversive potentially than other art forms. Right. It's also multi-sensorial yeah. because you're getting towards something like reality that you lose when you're literally stringing things out in a linear way. Which that was Marshall McLuhan yeah. saying, you know, the Gutenberg galaxy and that sort of thing. Yeah. And we're closing quotes on that extension of our consciousness and so forth. So we're getting back to it. Well, uh, go ahead. Yeah. And it can work both ways, yeah. right? And uh -huh. artists can express their vision. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, activists mm -hmm. or, you know, political dissent can be expressed with mm -hmm. film. Um, but also. With seriousness. And you can also come at it with great humor. Comedy. comedy, yeah, comedy, yeah, um, and uh, but and then also governments can create propaganda, yeah, which they do, they all do of them, artfully, yeah, it's a great art form. Well, that's the industry of advertising. Yeah. And I do have to say that I do admire, I really do. It's I, I don't like it, and I have a great deal of frustration and anger with it. But I admire the brilliance. Mm -hmm. Of the propaganda machine of this administration, yeah, I think they're Mr. geniuses and so forth. Yeah, absolutely, the geniuses. Mm -hmm. They're geniuses at branding. Mm -hmm. They're geniuses at expressing things the way they want to express them. They're geniuses at making people view the world how they want them to view it. And right. I admire their skill. Yeah, yeah. I despise mm -hmm. their ends. Uh huh. Uh -huh. Um, and uh -huh. what they use it for. Uh huh. But I do admire their skill. I think if they wanted to, they could easily those people. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't know who they all are, mm -hmm. they could start the most successful ad agency in the world right. if they leave the they administration. They maybe have. It's called, you know, Ad uh, <laughs> 16 Pennsylvania Avenue. Yeah. I mean, that's the biggest con that's the biggest account of them all, I think, do you see? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Huh? And uh, so, um, um, I, so I decided, you know, because I was sort of, uh, to be honest, I was one of those people, I'm sure you know them, mm -hmm. but maybe you've been this person at times where you're, it's so angry that you're like a raging, <laughs> ranting person, and yeah. then you encounter somebody who yeah. says something like, um, you know, they, they say something like, um, oh, I don't know. You know what they say? They, they apologize for the administration. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, right after 9/11, yeah. and I, I was devastated, yeah, you know, was by yeah. the attack. Yeah. I mean, personally, yeah. and, um, you know, I I didn't know anybody who died, but I certainly know people who did, and it was what a horrible yeah. thing to yeah. for all of us to live through. Yeah. Um, um, but, you know, I remember people saying over and over again, people, friends of mine, mm -hmm. you know, articulate, intelligent, socially progressive New Yorkers mm. about the invasion of Afghanistan. They said, well, we, ha we have to do something. Yeah, right. Do you right, remember right. that? People yeah, I that? remember that. I mean, I... I we have to do something. I, w I always thought it would be good to take cognizance of what does it mean. Well, it's like yeah, that we have to do something, beginning. but does yeah. that mean and no. it's like how no. we get from we have to do something to we have to, to invade other countries? And kill a lot of innocent people. <laughs> yeah, right. It was interesting, mm. but I'm saying mm. people I knew, you know, mm. were people who I, I felt at times I felt like that guy in the movie The Invasion, The Body Snatchers. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> do you remember? <laughs> yes, I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. I was this yeah. guy who was ranting and raving, yeah. arguing with people. Yeah, me too. Yeah. And then I figured something out, and it was sort of by chance because I hooked up with a, an organization in New York that, uh, that originated in New York, uh -huh. and it's an anti-Bush group called Billionaires for Bush. Oh, yeah, I know them all. Phil T. Rich and yeah. all those Andrew guys. Boyd, yeah, Andrew Boyd. Phil T. Rich, he's a friend mm. of mine and yeah. a collaborator. Yeah, um, and they worked with my good friend uh, Mike Mikhail Horowitz, who's a great stand-up. Yeah, but go ahead. Yeah. And um, I just, uh, I just uh, saw a notice about a meeting they were having, and mm -hmm. I went. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is very interesting to me, Billionaires mm -hmm. for Bush. Because mm -hmm. it's an anti-Bush group just trying mm -hmm. to express the fact mm -hmm. that billionaire, you know, that Bush benefits billionaires. Yes. And almost no one else except multimillionaires, perhaps. Yeah. A um, couple of them are let in the back door yeah. once in a while. Yeah, but mm -hmm. it, was a, it was based in comedy. Uh, and yes, humor. yes, yes. And it was using humor uh -huh. and comedy mm -hmm. to... Um, you know, to express a very simple point, which is billionaires support Bush because Bush helps billionaires. Right. It's a constituency. And it's it is a, a fact. special interest group. Yeah, it is a fact. Yeah. That yeah. we have more billionaires than yeah. ever, yeah. and the, the the discrepancies between the lower income and, and it's growing. I mean, no, we can argue. Yeah, it just yeah. keeps growing. And it's growing, growing on a world scale yeah. too. The whole the whole dynamic is there. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. And the propaganda and here machine. here are the billionaires. Yeah. Right. And the propaganda machine is so brilliant that these people that keep getting pushed down, down, down. Uh huh. Are the base of support? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, That's right. That's the base right. of the support. You look right. at the states; right. every right. single rural yeah. county uh -huh. in the United States of America voted for Bush four yeah. years ago. In the train, yeah. And yeah. yet, the amount what he's doing for the people in these rural communities yeah. is um, beyond devastating. Me. No, yeah. no, I mean yeah. they're devastating. You know, yeah. they're. So anyway, they uh, vote against their interest for some yes. reason. Yeah. Well, oh. it's because of the brilliance of this propaganda machine. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so, so anyway, um, I, you know, I hooked up with this group, and, and I really like what they do. And what they, what their art form is, uh -huh. is they show up at protest. They show up and protest things as billionaires. Yeah, with tuxedos. Yeah, they dress oh, up in tuxedos, yachting caps. Yeah, right. Um, maybe a monocle, yeah. top hats, yeah. and they dress up. And then they have these brilliant signs and mm -hmm. slogans that they've come up with. Um, uh, you know. Oh God, my brain goes blank. Um, no, but yeah. like blood for oil. Yeah, that's the darkest one they mm, really use. Mm. Um, you know, tax work not wealth. Yes, right. <laughs> uh, widen the healthcare gap. Right. Um, yeah. You know, uh, th and they show up with these signs and they protest these things now because the protest movement is so drab. Uh -huh. Yeah, it's so problematic right now. Mm -hmm. They get all this news coverage. Mm -hmm. Writers love to write about them because they're funny. Yes. They're creative. Funny. Look at how popular Jon Stewart is now. The comedy, all the young people only watch the Comedy Channel anymore because it's so absurd. Yeah. So you want to laugh. And that's the best way to get at something yeah. is through good satirical humor, I yeah. think, you know. And I think Dr. Strangelove. And what a yeah. brilliant yeah, film, right? Yeah, right. And a uh, funny film. Yeah, right? funny. Yeah. And but so, dead serious. Yeah. And yeah. I spent the last uh, two years studying improv comedy. Uh huh. 
at two very excellent improv theaters in the city here, the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater. I don't know that one. <laughs> the Upright <laughs> Citizens. i got to meet them, yeah. And, well, you should check them out. Yeah, I will. Really I will. I will. And then um, uh, the People's Improv Theater. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Which started off as sort of a splinter group from the Upright Citizens Brigade okay, Theater. Okay, right. And while they sound, uh, I guess they do have names that sound slightly um, red or communist, they have nothing to do with that except right, right. in just trying to spread improv comedy around mm. the world. Good, great. Yes, right. and it's, uh, it's a great technique, and I've had a great time studying it, and I've been performing it regularly at times, and uh, it's a huge challenge. So comedy, yeah. billionaires for Bush. Yeah. And I went into the organization, and I thought, you know what, I really like what they do because they show up. They're funny. They attract attention. Uh -huh. People write about them. People mm. want to interview them. Mm. And I thought, I want to make a piece of media uh -huh. with this same concept. Right, right. But I wanted to put a twist to it because I think if it was as funny and silly as they are, I mean, yeah. I don't I mean silly yeah, in the best possible yeah, way. Yeah, right, 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 right. I thought it would wear thin quickly. Yeah. And I think in film, the basis of comedy is in truth. Yeah, okay. okay. That if you think of your funniest films, your, your favorite comedies, uh-huh. You boil it down, you'll, you'll, you'll see that the, that the hero, the protagonist of the comedy mm -hmm. is truthful mm -hmm. and feeling things from the heart start mm -hmm. to finish. Yeah, maybe the player. <laughs> but any, uh, let we, let, okay, okay, right, okay, good. And you put this one together, this film, and maybe, because we want to get to running. Let's watch it. Yeah, well, no, no, it's all right. You want to set it up a little more. Well. And that's what it is. And maybe you set it up and then let's run it, because we want to be sure and get to let the people see this. But absolutely. set it up a little for it. What is yeah. it now? And Well, uh, it's called it Our is, Vision, Our Future. All right. And it it's can be accessed on the Internet? Absolutely. Yeah. You can watch. This is mm -hmm. not only, this is another thing about digital filmmaking. Yeah. Is you can distribute your film, your, your film yourself. Right. On the internet, isn't that great? Oh yeah, I like that. Don't oh, you? Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yes, right. Oh. And I don't know if you know the term virus, uh, internet uh, website spreading virally, but what it means is uh, word um, of mouth. Well, yeah, it means that by the internet, people see and say to their friends, "Check it out." Yeah, all you do is click and forward. Yeah. And there it is. Yeah, right. So my site right now is spreading virally. Every day we have twenty percent more users great. than we had the day before. Great, great, great. Uh, the website is. Ourfuture.us. Okay. www.ourfuture.us. Right. You can go US. there. Now, we've got the film, and maybe you could set up specifically. What are we going to see? We're going to run about a 10 minute piece here. Yeah, now? we're going to run a 10 minute yeah, segment. Now we, of it. And we want to make sure we get it all in. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And it's, uh, it's from the show, and mm -hmm. it's a 30 minute show. Mm -hmm. You can screen it as a 30 minute continuous piece, uh -huh. or you can screen it as in, s in different segments. We're going to mm -hmm. look at two segments right All now. All right, let's go. And Good. I think they speak for themselves. So you let's think take a they look speak at for them. themselves? I do. And okay, and it's got a, a satirical bite, and it's the program. We're talking now with Mark Vopel, and it's his film, Our Future, Our, Our Vision, Our Future. Uh, .us, and let's run that now. Set it up and run that now. It speaks for itself. Thank you. Welcome back to Our Vision, Our Future. Jennifer, what if I were to tell you that there are people out there in this great country of ours that are using our tax dollars, our tax dollars to fund their liberal agenda? Well, I'd be outraged. What if I told you those same people had an explicit anti-billionaire policy, just like John Kerry? Well, I'd be even more outraged. That would be economic racism, wouldn't it? It would be. You would probably want somebody to do something about that, wouldn't you? I would demand it. Well. Ladies and gentlemen, please allow me to introduce Ron Redford. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You know, Forrest is quite right. There are voices in the media that oppose the billionaire point of view. Now, Ron, why don't you tell us what you're doing in our battle against economic prejudice in the media? Well, thanks for asking, Forrest. What I like to do is buy up all the media outlets that I can, including some that are anti-billionaire which I then transform completely using a process that I like to call massive layoffs. They come around to our point of view pretty quickly after that. See, I own a very large media conglomerate, and we're very vertically integrated. Vertically integrated? That sounds like you're saying your company is tall. <laughs> <laughs> That's not it, Jennifer. No, it's really very simple. Vertically integrated just means that we combine media, content, and distribution in all its various forms. Oh, like TV. Well, sure, we own a TV network and a number of cable networks as well. But we also have a movie studio, a news service, and a dozen newspapers. Wow, that's a lot of media. Well, I'm not <laughs> done yet, Jennifer. You know, in one city alone, 
We own the sports teams, the sports stadiums, the sports stations, plus the cable system and its high-speed internet service. Wow, all that media in one person's hands. You're very powerful. Well, not powerful enough. <laughs> you see, the Justice Department, antitrust, and agencies like the FCC still stand in the way of complete media consolidation. Well, what can we do about it? Well, it's very simple, Jennifer. We just need to renew this administration for another four seasons. I mean four years. <laughs> you know, Bush has already put a number of our friends in senior positions, but he's got a lot more work to do. Once Bush is able to completely deregulate media ownership, we can eliminate anti-billionaire voices completely. And when they're gone? Well, then you'll have what we like to refer to as perfect media saturation. That's where no matter where you turn, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, You'll get news, entertainment, and information all completely controlled by billionaires. Life through a billionaire's lens. And then we'll have a level playing field. A level playing field? Jennifer, how many times do you vote on election day? Well, just once, like everybody else. Well, that's not really fair, is it, Jennifer? I mean, here you are with over a billion dollars, and other people, some of whom have, well, next to nothing, and yet you each have one vote. You see... Billionaires make up only a, a millionth of the population. So democracy, let's face it, doesn't really work for us. So with a media that presents only our point of view, we're just evening the score. Exactly. We're making progress, but everything we've built is being threatened by John Kerry. Now, Bush has taken us where we need to go, but he needs our help so he can get that show renewed for four more seasons. And how can we help? We can help by making a donation to billionairesforbush.com. Just go to www.billionairesforbush.com and click on that donation button. Welcome back to Our Vision, Our Future. Forrest, you and your friends have taught me a lot today, but it seems like solving all these problems takes a lot of time. Changing laws, replacing judges, hiring, firing. I mean, am I the only impatient billionaire? Oh, of course not, Jennifer. Let's see if we can find a faster solution. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give a big billionaire welcome to a Mr. William Cordich. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, Mr. Cordich, you're a senior executive at one of the largest corporations in the world, and I might add, one of the most diversified. Isn't that right? 110% correct, Mr. Winnower. Now, who is your number one client? My number one client is the United States of America. Oh, that's something new on today's show. What do you do for Uncle Sam, Mr. Cordich? We design, manufacture, and implement weapons technologies. Things that go boom? Indeed, Miss Fairmont. Things that go boom. Our other industry is building, or in some cases, rebuilding, infrastructure. Well, that's interesting. Why would Uncle Sam want to rebuild infrastructure? Because he destroyed it. Uh, and what did he destroy it with? The weapons technologies we sold him. <laughs> Wait a minute. You're talking about war, aren't you? That's right, Jennifer. You see, Uncle Sam buys weapons from Mr. Cordich and uses them to destroy another country's infrastructure, then hires Mr. Cordich to rebuild that country's infrastructure. Presto, it's an endless cycle of corporate profit. As long as you keep finding countries that want to go to war with us, oh, right? Oh, not a problem. Yesterday it was Afghanistan, today Iraq, tomorrow... Let's just say there's a long-term plan. We also subcontract certain field operations during the destruction of the infrastructure, or war, as you like to put it, Miss Fairmont. Well, that sounds dangerous. Many highly profitable activities are dangerous. So, are you actually out there fighting the battles? That's the one thing we don't do. The American enlisted men do the fighting. Though you might be interested to know that I started out in the field as a military intelligence subcontractor. I still supervise those activities for the corporation. I just returned from Baghdad last week. Military intelligence? You mean like maps and statistics? No, not really. My particular area of expertise is extracting security information from the enemy in the form of interviews. We like to say we find the answers to the important questions. Well, war does have its dark side. Uh, you can't change that. Otherwise, they wouldn't call it war. Now, let me point out that John Kerry wanted to have more of our allies on board before we invaded Iraq. Now, what would that have meant, Mr. Cordage? A disaster. Mm. The war might never have happened. Our so-called allies wanted us to pursue diplomatic solutions. And we American billionaires would have had to share all those business contracts with foreign companies. 
Another disaster, right, Mr. Cordish? Indeed. That is why I am a billionaire for Bush. I support the president and the vice president. He used to be my CEO. So now I'd like to bring out someone new. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jimmy Little. Listen, uh, I asked to come on this show to let you all know that Mr. Cordage here ain't the only one on this gravy train. It is room for lots of people to jump on board. Back home, we call this a bandwagon. A bandwagon? The war, little lady. The war. <laughs> you see, I'm an oil man. Now, Jimmy, didn't you once tell me you were having a problem with your company profits? Heck yeah. You know what it takes to find these oil fields and set up the rigs and drill halfway to China? Well, it costs a lot of money. Well, that's why my profits go up and down like some kind of roller coaster. But once we get our hands on a proven oil field, already got the rigs, kaboom! <laughs> no problems with the profits. Sounds too good to be true. Yes, well, Uncle Sam buys weapons from Mr. Cordage. He takes over these oil fields. Then they turn it all over to me. That's what we call business. Ain't that right, partner? <laughs> now, some people say four more years. And Mr. Cordish and I, we have a different philosophy. Tell him, Mr. Gay. Four more wars. Oh, we can barely hear you. Four more wars. I'm sorry, did you just say four more wars? That's right, Punkin. You heard him right. Four more wars. <laughs> Four more wars. 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 Right. Four more wars. Four more wars. That's really funny. That's really funny, and it's so really good. Congratulations on that. Well, thank yeah. you. You know, I war, had more war. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had so many people that collaborated on it, and it was yeah. great because people just wanted to work on something. Yeah, which was moving in this direction, which was yeah. making these points. And uh, um, you know, I've w what I've been doing for the past three weeks. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, I wish I'd finished this project sooner. But mm. uh, is I've been working really hard on getting it on the air in swing yeah. states. Yeah on other public access stations right. and college stations. Great, great, great. And it's not that many, but I've got about 30 so far. Good for you. Mm -hmm. It's a good yeah. start, young man. That's yeah. great and everything. And one of the great things about <coughs> that, it seems to me, there could be people who would be watching that, and they wouldn't even know that it was satirical. There would be people who would say, yes, you know, you know they, that's writing that, that, that line. That's really clever. Well, um, I mean, I think, I, I don't know if it would always cotton on or not, but... You know what I'm saying? Well, it's I, not right in the... Well, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. It's great humor is what it is. Well, yeah. no, no. Your yeah. point is yeah. completely well taken yeah. because, in all honesty, I wanted to have something where people would be flipping through the channels yeah. and they'd come upon it <laughs> and yeah. they'd say, what is this? <laughs> they would be like, uh, hold on. They'd have to watch it. And you know how... Um, mm. I mean, it's a very blurred line we have in media now yeah, between uh, rea you know, reality yeah. <laughs> and, you know, so by the supposedly reality and what is supposedly fiction, and right. you know, right. I, I think that uh, I, I think we underestimate the value of fiction. Sometimes. Yeah, uh huh. You know, okay. that we think if something is most valuable because it's supposedly true. Yeah, and so and also so strident necessarily, thing, but satire is the bit most cutting edge kind of thing you can come up yeah. with if it's carefully modulated and done well and not over the top. Absolutely. Now, yeah. the, and that this is why it's different than what billionaires for Bush have been doing previously, because mm -hmm. I've tried to adapt it for a different medium, which is television. Television is cool yeah. medium. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I want to, you know, I think, um, I think film uh, stories are by nature subversive because mm -hmm. the whole idea is to pull you in, uh -huh. okay, uh -huh. and to give you a main character, a protagonist that yeah. you care about. Uh huh. Um, 
So, you know, I tried to do that, that I wanted these people to be sympathetic. Uh -huh. You know, the billionaires themselves to start off as yeah. somewhat sympathetic characters. Yeah, and you, right. You care about them. But my mm. mother lives in Atlanta. Now, all mm. my focus has been on the swing states. Yes, right. Like I said, I've got 30 stations um, in, in swing the swing states. states. They're all in the swing states? Yeah. All in okay. swing states oh, that yeah. are committed to showing this Great. program. Great, yeah, right, right, right. Well. And uh, that's uh, been my, my focus. My mother, however, lives in uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Right, Georgia. That's the um, home of Zell Miller. Yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> Um, <laughs> and she's uh, she's she's uh, I'm not, but mm. she is a new age spiritualist. Oh, and, okay. Uh, uh -huh. mm. She's part of a uh, internet community called the Cosmic Networkers. I see. Okay. Uh huh. So she sent out to many of the Cosmic Networkers down in uh, Georgia. Yeah. Um, the link to my site, and she's forwarded me four emails from them. Right. Where they're commenting on how much they've learned, how informative it is. <laughs> Oh, yeah, no, but it, you know it, yeah. the, the thing is, in a way, this this I think this yeah. stuff is more truthful than yeah. other stuff you can find. Right, 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 right. Exactly, right. That's yeah. a, that's very good. Congratulations on it. Listen, so that we don't lose, yeah. it, we want to let people know again. It's yeah. our vision, our either our vision dot us or our future dot us. We'll get you to the site uh, and you uh, can see the clips right so right on your screen. Yeah, it may be too complicated, but they can also go to www.billionairesforbush.com, dot com, uh -huh. which is the home site for billionaires for Bush. Right, right. And right. on there on the first page it will say look at our new infomercial all right that's great that's yeah. great now we want and we and they, we want to do and, and, and the thing is we want to make sure we get it in you have another one another clip that we could show right well I do yeah I mean yeah. It's, there's seven clips there's seven um, clips in all right yeah. and overall it's a half an hour is yeah, that it's what a half, it is? it's a full uh -huh. half hour program uh-huh where did you shoot it now? um I shot it uh, on a stage here in New York uh-huh uh -huh. and um, got good actors yeah, yeah. Well, I worked well you know that's what it's all about yeah right, right you know yeah. Characters, you know, yeah, performances. Right. And, yeah. uh, I worked really hard on the casting, mm -hmm. and I'm, I, I'm so happy with my actors. Well, congratulations, um, Mr. Yeah. Auteur, you know, on having put this together. And well. It was your idea, and it's really clever. Yeah. yeah, and it's really uh, effective. Yeah, you, thank you. And you mm. know, I didn't, I didn't finish that previous thought, but yeah. what uh, of saying that I was once a ranting, raging guy arguing with people, uh -huh. and once I set out to make this project, uh -huh. this was a much more constructive use of my energy yeah. than getting right. angry. Yeah, you know, and then you know, yeah. and, I, and to to put it into a project, and, and I do think you know what what we are fighting is a media war. Yeah, it would you know? be. What you want to maybe think about doing is laugh them out of power. Laugh them out of power. power. Yeah. I mean, that seems to me to be an appropriate thing. They did it. Remember Chaplin did that against Nazi uh, <laughs> Hitler with his ball up in the air and everything yeah. like that? And I, I mean, that that's really cutting-edge stuff. So, listen, we've got another clip that maybe we can show. You I don't know if you want to right away? Yeah, well, let's make sure we get it in. That's all. Yeah. And we've, we've only got about ten minutes left. So let's make okay. sure we get yeah. that in. Let's show this one. In. Now, I do, I do want to say that, um, <laughs> uh, that this one, that... This is, I would say, the most inflammatory segment, uh, and uh, I would say that it, it's the only segment that I made, mm -hmm. which is a little controversial um, among some people. Oh, all right. But I, but I, but not that many. Mm -hmm. but I just want to okay. say it up front that um, you know that <laughs> it, it deals with a very serious subject. But you know, sometimes you either have to laugh or cry. What's a serious subject? Um, terrorism. Terrorism is yeah. a serious subject. It is, so it is a very serious subject. And we've got the, a little segment from uh, Our Future, Our World, uh, Our Vision, Our Future, uh, U, .us, and let's set that up and run that now. I, this is the controversial piece, the only controversial piece that's in the, the most. The most controversial piece yeah. in the overall work. Yeah. Let's run that now then, please. Thank you. Our vision, our future. Now, Jennifer, here's something that's a big part of our present and an even bigger part of our future. What's that? Terrorism. That's right, I said terrorism. Now, come on, people. A show like this wouldn't be much use if we didn't talk about the problem of terrorism. Oh, you're right about that. Terrorism is a very big problem. Yes, it is. Fortunately, there's a very simple solution. More terrorism. I'm sorry, I must have heard you wrong. Did you just say that the solution to terrorism is more terrorism? You better believe it. But how? Well, it's simple as pie. And speaking of pie, I'd like to bring out a friend of mine with a few pie charts who's going to talk us through this. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Taylor Kaufman. Now, Taylor, you're a CEO of a major insurance firm, aren't you? Uh, that's correct. And you have some data you'd like to share with us? That's right. It's a simple matter of numbers. Wait a second, Taylor. Numbers? This sounds complicated. Well, it might at first, but trust me, there's really nothing simpler. 
Now, as our first chart indicates, 100% of all terror victims have a personal fortune of less than $1 billion. In other words, not one billionaire has died as a result of a terror attack. In fact, not one billionaire has been injured as a result of a terror attack. Thank goodness for that. Now, 9-11 has given us compelling reasons to raise insurance premiums. Because of the ongoing threat of terrorism, we've been able to raise insurance premiums across the board. Well, I mean, that sounds great, but what happens if there is another terrorist attack and insurance companies are forced to pay out? Yeah, that's just it. Most of our new contracts have a standard clause that specifically excludes terrorism as a payable cause of death, injury, or even loss of property. You mean... What I mean is, we're raising insurance premiums because of terrorism, but we won't have to pay out on a terrorist attack. And as a result, we're making billions of dollars in profits. Wow, that sounds great for the billionaires in insurance. It's not just insurance, though. It's security firms, mm -hmm. contractors, weapons manufacturers, mm -hmm. uh, news stations, you name it. It basically is helping all billionaires all across the board. Indeed. Now, as our last chart indicates, during Bush's presidency, his policies have actually raised the number of terrorist acts and terrorist attacks. And as a result, we billionaires stand to make, well, <laughs> billions. And I'll tell you this, Kerry's policy on terrorism isn't more terrorism, it's less. No, nah, boo. No good. Mm. No good for the billionaire's bottom line. Wow, who would have guessed it? Terrorism is good for us billionaires. You can't argue with those numbers. George W. Bush's terror-generating foreign policy has been good for us billionaires. We'll be right back.
the reality. If you ever had a problem about trying to have your satire that you write and come up with not being able to measure up to the satirical content of what's actually in the, 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 the reality, as you begin to look at it, you take a television cut and you sometimes think it is a piece of comedy, and yet the people are being dead serious. Do you understand what I mean? Oh, totally. That the, rea that the reality is so funny that you can hardly improve upon it in the name of satire. But I think you just use it. You know, yeah. you have to, you, you know, everything, you just use what you have. Yeah. You know, right. I actually, you know, I mean, I've, my career, I've gone through all these different situations, and uh, my philosophy is I've chosen to be here. I'm going to just use what I have and yeah. do the best with it. Yeah, right. right. You know, and now, uh, you know, with DV, I've made, and I, I yeah. do say that. Wait, look at the, look at what you've got before you, right? You've got this absurd world yeah. with all the stuff that they feed you, and then you can just improve on it and put it out. You've got one of the best jobs and one of the best positions in the whole universe, don't you think? Do you realize that? As a that? filmmaker or yes. a CUNY professor? Yes. Uh, no, not as a CUNY <laughs> professor. I wouldn't think necessarily, though yes. CUNY's lucky to have you. Yeah. But, I mean, what a wonderful thing to be able to uh, look out. Yeah. It, it's, uh, what it is is Spaceship Earth is providing you with a lot of material. Yeah. Well, the um, <laughs> I do want to point out for people that are thinking, hey, maybe I should try this. Yes. Yeah, well, why not? Yeah, I do We should have the Olympics of comedy, right? Olympics of satirical comedy? Why don't they have an Academy Award contest? You know, uh, you should have an Academy well, Award. There are comedy Did you ever festivals. win a Cleo? I did win a Cleo. Did you win a Cleo? I did win a Cleo. Congratulations. Once. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It was for a piece that was 100% computer generated. <laughs> yes. But I did win a Cleo. Um, okay. But, um,. And I'm relatively new to comedy, to yeah. be honest. This, the last couple of years of really studying it seriously. But it is fun, isn't it? Oh, my it? God. Isn't it's it fun? addictive. Yeah, you know? right, right. But right. I want to point out that I, the total budget for hard cost yeah. for my entire project right. it was, let's say, $4,000. Really? That for was half an hour. Yeah, yeah for a half an hour of well, primetime TV. Yeah. Well, it's not on primetime yet. No, but it might be. Maybe. It might be getting on there. I'll Maybe. bet you it's not going to be long before it'll be on you know, Letterman or something, you know, going yeah. across the nation. The it's on the internet everywhere <laughs> in the world, young man. Yeah. So the question is maybe, what can people do now? Yeah, right. Now, we only um, got a couple days it's before only this election. A couple days before the election, so yeah. there's only so much we can do. Yeah. But there are swing states that are pretty nearby New York. Yeah. There's Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. Ohio. Uh, if you maybe. have a car, you mm -hmm. can go out there. There's people that are, have organizations set up, and uh, I don't have their name right now, uh -huh. where you can help drive people to the polls. Yeah. Um, you could also steer people to my website. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I want to just get it in because we're coming to the end of the time. Yeah. I'm sorry we could. And one of the best things they do to get fueled up is to go to our vision, or our future dot us. www.ourfuture.us. That's it. And they can watch the program or they can forward it to their friends. Uh huh. Um, and also, let's not forget that our work is not done. Oh, after not the election. at all. Not at all. No. We've all, we have yeah. not yet begun to. Uh, 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 Mock. I am very. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm very confident Kerry's going to win this election. You are confident. I'm, that, I, huh? I don't even think it's going to be close uh -huh. enough that to steal one state mm -hmm. is going to make a difference. With all the electronic machines, you I don't know what's going to happen because we're. You know, I don't know what's going to happen between the day we're taping it, which is this is on a Wednesday. Monday. No, this is a Monday. We should yeah. air Friday. I think. Yeah, yeah, Monday between now and, and the election, we don't mm -hmm. know exactly what's going to happen. Uh -huh. but I'm very confident Kerry's going to win, and everybody's going to be surprised. Like, oh my God, how did he get? Three to five percent mm -hmm. more votes in the mm -hmm. polls. None of the polls predicted that, but I think that's what's going to happen. Then we're going to have a whole new cast of characters. Well, I, I think our work isn't done if, mm -hmm. if Kerry even is elected president, mm -hmm. because the you know the military-industrial complex is as still Eisenhower, in place, Mr. Eisenhower referred to military-industrial intelligence complex. Is that what he originally said? Originally, he didn't say it in public speech, but oh. originally that's what he wrote. Yeah. Like uh, you know, uh, property instead of yeah. uh, pursuit of freedom. Or it's never of, of happiness. Yeah. It's safe to say it's here to stay. Yeah, it's here to stay. And there's and not going to be any end of material, right? No, and it's like one president, and we saw, you know, uh, to try to change it is, is uh, whether or not he really wants to change it. Uh-huh. Or, you know, if is he able. is able to change mm -hmm. it. It really, we, we have, have to work together. Do we have the to change it? We're not, and I'm not talking about getting rid of it because you can't, but mm. just, just to keep people appraised of where their tax dollars are going. Right, all right, fine. Because, you know, who's paying for the war? And all of this might lead to the actual vision coming out in the end because if there's nothing else, we're going to laugh this situation out of existence and try and bring about some sort of a perhaps liberating order in which some of the nonsense can be ironed out eventually. And if it is, it's going to be work like yours, and I congratulate you very much.